Chemwa says, our program is definitely the best. Thank you. Okay, Susan, so this is your first time joining us. All right, where is everybody tuning in from? I want to ask, because uh, sometimes you guys are coming from all over the world, sometimes locally, different time zones. So if you're joining us and it's the middle of the night where you are, we're so grateful. Uh, okay, Miss Leglam says, our program is helping you understand the content better. Excellent. Irene loves reviewing with Bootcamp. Irene, we love to hear it. So where are you guys tuning in from? The U.S.? Maybe what state in the U.S.? Shantae's from Texas. Same here, Shantae. Miami, California, Nashville, all over. Very good. If anybody is joining us from Pennsylvania, you guys should come say hello. We're going to be uh, the rest of this week at the Student Nurse Association for Pennsylvania Conference, the SNAP convention there. So we would love to see you. And Jay-Z, I see, oh, you're in Pittsburgh, California, not, not uh, Pennsylvania. So... All right, very good. Well, we're gonna go ahead and get started because we've got a couple people showed up. So my name is Dr. Emily. I'm one of the co-creators here at NCLEX Bootcamp. We're also gonna have Dr. Courtney in the chat moderating. She's our psychiatric expert and you probably remember her from some of her lectures that she does here for our webinar series. So we are gonna be talking today about how to answer next-gen NCLEX case studies. And this is gonna make up the biggest part of the exam. And you guys have probably heard that Bootcamp is really well known for having excellent high quality quality case studies and video rationales. And so just giving you guys a little bit more insight today into how to think like a nurse as you answer these case studies. So I'm going to ask you guys to quantify on a scale from zero to 10, how confident are you in answering case studies on the NCLEX with zero being not at all confident and 10 being completely confident. Um, and hopefully by the time that you leave today, you will be bumped up at least a couple more points in your preparedness. So I'm going to be trying to answer all your questions between myself and Dr. Courtney here. If you see me looking off to the side, that's what I'm doing is I'm just tracking with your comments, but there is a little bit of a delay, so hang with me. And OJ, the venue in Pennsylvania, it's in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and you can just search Student Nurse Association of Pennsylvania, and we'll see you there. So, all right, we are going to be talking about how to answer next-gen case studies. First, we'll look at the next-gen case study format and then spend most of our time practicing together how to think like a nurse. So first, the case study format. So the big difference between the old NCLEX and the new NCLEX is that they now incorporate this clinical judgment piece, and they test your ability to exercise clinical judgment by giving you these case studies. And each of these case studies is going to be six questions long, and each of the six steps corresponds to one question, and it's a different step in how a nurse thinks. And you might not be familiar with this, but you've probably seen the nursing process before, your ADPI, and these really closely parallel each other. So first, you're going to be recognizing cues or assessing what's most important, because as a nurse, we always have lots of cues coming at us at one time and we can't give the same attention to everything and then analyzing those cues or diagnosing what it could mean then kind of our care planning step where we're prioritizing where we start and then generating solutions for what we can do to address that priority problem then finally taking action and evaluating if it helped so you guys know how to do this this is just kind of different language for the same thing so in every case uh, in every NCLEX a minimum length NCLEX, you have three full length case studies. So that means it makes up about 25% of your score. So that is bigger than any of the client need areas for the standalones. This is the part on the NCLEX that you want to be most comfortable with. And that's what we're here to help with. And then if you require longer than a minimum length exam, so longer than those 85 questions, you're going to get additional clinical judgment standalones. So those are going to be your bow tie items and trend items. And we also have plenty of those for you guys to practice with. All right, so thinking like a nurse, the first thing when you actually open a case study is you are gonna have lots of data tabs here. And let me show you what I mean. So when you open a case study, you are gonna be able to click through your patient's chart, just like in real life, right? You guys might've heard that the NCLEX is vague, and that is true for the standalone items where you have just a diagnosis, what do you do? So you have only enough information to answer the question, whereas in the case studies, this is a lot more reflective of real life practice where we've got tons of stuff to look at. And so my best tip for you guys to make sure you don't kind of get overwhelmed by all the details and lose sight of the big picture is to really try and picture 
and envision that scenario closely. So in a second, we're gonna read through this together and I want you to kind of keep in mind this picture that's forming in front of you because that's gonna help you prioritize things correctly and prioritization is a big part of the NCLEX. Then we're gonna think what is the priority problem here and then each time the case updates, so say we move forward a couple questions, then maybe the patient's admitted to the hospital. It's gonna tell us up here that we've got a new nurse's note, for example, and then we read that update. Make sure you revisit that every time and update that mental picture if you need to. All right, so we're gonna practice reading this together. So first, for recognizing cues, we're gonna be asked in the first question, what's most important? And the NCLEX can ask that a couple of different ways. <clears throat> they like to say what requires immediate follow-up or which, however many findings, are most concerning because we can't give the same attention to everything. And so we're gonna be looking specifically for unexpected abnormals. Some abnormal findings are expected, right? And don't actually require us to do anything. And then if you're stuck, my next tip is to ask this question for how would I follow up? Because you're gonna see that some things that maybe look like priority findings, when you actually think through how you would address it, it wouldn't make sense for that given scenario. So we're gonna read this together. And remember what we're trying to answer here is we're looking for the top four findings that require immediate follow-up. And if you guys already have an idea based on what's here, um, please start dropping your guesses what number options you think the top four are in the chat. But we're going to read this together and I'm going to highlight anything that seems especially important. All right. So for this patient, we've got a 57-year-old male. He's come to the emergency department after feeling short of breath and having a cough for the last two days. So visualize this, right? 57 year old guy, so he's like not yet retirement age, he's short of breath, he's coughing. This has been happening for two days. He's been sleeping on two pillows, so he's probably upright talking to us, waking up coughing several times at night. Then he's been feeling very fatigued and spends most of the day in the bed or the chair. He appears anxious. We review his history and we find he's got a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, chronic stable angina, and diabetes. So this is like cardiovascular disease bingo, right? He's got all the risk factors for heart disease here. He expresses a concern that he can't quite afford his medications. So keep this picture in mind as we move on to our more objective data and the assessment and vital signs is that he's short of breath, he's coughing, he's got all these heart history factor, risk factors, and which four findings require immediate follow-up. And I don't see any guesses yet, so you guys want to wait and see the rest of it, I see. Then we perform our assessment. He's oriented. That's good. We listen to his lungs and we hear crackles. We have an S1, S2, and an S3 heart sound. Our bowel sounds are normal. Cap refills normal. Pulses are but we've got one plus pitting edema in our bilateral lower extremities. So add to this picture of this not yet retirement age guy, he's short of breath, he's coughing, he's anxious. Then when I listen to his chest, I hear crackles and an S3. And when I assess his extremities, I find pitting edema. So am I worried about like, what is my priority problem here? If you guys were say making a care plan, what do you think your number one like nursing diagnosis, and you can keep it loose. Do we have an issue with breathing? Do we have an issue with circulation? Do we have an issue with volume status? So kind of start thinking about this as we go. All right, Vanessa says she's worried about cough, respirations. Nina says shortness of breath, crackles, respirations, pulse. Yes, I, I agree with several of these things, you guys, because we are gonna be looking for those priority problems of airway, breathing, and circulation, of which he has several. So then we get our vital signs, we find his temperature is normal, but his pulse is a little high, his respirations are a little high, his blood pressure is high as well, and then his pulse oximetry is low. So you guys know, and I don't have to tell you, that when we're looking for the top findings, we are going to prioritize any unexpected findings of airway, breathing, or circulation. And so I'm going to go ahead and check off the ones that you guys have said. You've said breathing so respirations right he's breathing quickly at 25 times a minute where your upper limit of normal is 20 probably as a compensatory mechanism because his pulse oximetry is low and that's why he's reporting to us shortness of breath and remember when we had listened to his lung sounds we heard crackles and so if he has crackles in his lungs 
there's something there in the alveoli that is going to be blocking that exchange of gas. And so that's likely the underlying problem. And you guys got it. You, you guessed several of these, but this is how things happen on the NCLEX is the distractors seemed just as likely to some of you. So let's talk about why these ones would not require immediate follow-up. So those of you who chose the cough, maybe you recognize that this is a respiratory issue and that sounds a lot like a respiratory issue again so are the others but when i asked myself that question of how would i follow up with this what would i do about the cough would i like give him a cough drop have him gargle something there's nothing really immediate that i can do to help his cough so it's not going to be that one same thing with the edema um, maybe this is definitely an unexpected finding. We aren't told that he has any history of a condition that would explain edema, like peripheral vascular disease, varicose veins, where it might be expected. But again, what am I going to do about the edema directly? Nothing, right? Nothing urgent. Maybe I'd elevate his legs, um, assess for like the presence of any wounds from venous stasis, but there's nothing immediate that I need to do when I have the presence of crackles, tachypnea, hypoxemia, and dyspnea. Those need intervention right away, probably at least with oxygen, if nothing else, right? Raising the head of the bed if he's not already sitting up. You guys know what to do. The blood pressure. So the blood pressure is abnormal, but we don't know if this is an unexpected abnormal, right? We're told that this patient not only has hypertension, but also that he's been struggling to afford his medications. So he could very well have just skipped his meds this morning, or maybe he's stressed out because he's in the emergency department. Uh, so there's really not anything more urgent about the blood pressure than about these respiratory findings. Now, if it said that he had the worst headache of his life, and blurred vision and his blood pressure was much higher, maybe then I would need to immediately follow up on that. But it doesn't say that. It just says his blood pressure is 149 over 93. That can wait. Then inability to afford his medications. What would I do? Would I consult social work? And maybe at some point before discharge I would, but right now while he's short of breath and anxious, he's not going to hear a word that they have to say. History of chronic stable angina. That is going to give us some clues as to what might be causing his symptoms, but there's nothing I'm going to do to address this specifically. So we're going to prioritize these unexpected abnormal respiratory findings of crackles that's causing a hypoxemia and dyspnea and then a compensatory tachypnea. And we're right. And you guys will see here that in our question bank, um, the average score was only one out of four points, meaning they got one of these correct. So several of you got all of them, um, and I'm very proud of all of you. So Stella's asking, we choose things we can do something about, right? Yes, exactly. If there's something that there's nothing for us to do, like there's nothing for me to do about his history of chronic stable angina, that's in the past, right? Even if the thing you can do as a nurse is reporting to the healthcare provider, in, um, in the example of the splitting headache, what I would need to do is prepare them for a CT, right? So it's not necessarily a nursing action, but yes, don't prioritize following up on something that there's no follow-up required for. Good question. All right, so next. After we decide what's most important, we are going to then move on to our second piece, which is going to be analyzing those cues or figuring out what they could mean. And so I want to take a second and remind you guys that we do have cheat sheets available and Dr. Courtney is going to leave a link for you to access some of the cheat sheets that we have available for free. But these are going to focus on a lot of these tough topics. And when we're talking about step two, analyzing cues, that really requires you to have an understanding of the disease process or to know your content. And so we've got some cheat sheets for you guys to check out. Uh, for free as well just a handful of little teaser cheat sheets and she'll leave you the link for those but when we're thinking about analyzing cues the NCLEX wants to know that you know what those cues could mean and they might ask what conditions is the client experiencing or at risk for what disease processes could cause those findings or how you would know if this or that condition was happening 
And so the important thing here to consider is the big picture problem. Because in our example, we know that shortness of breath could mean a ton of things, right? It could be from pneumonia, it could be from heart failure, it could be from um, collapsed alveoli like an atelectasis. And so we have to consider the big picture. We already decided in step one that we're most worried about his difficulty breathing, right? And probably the, several of you said there's too much fluid on him, and I agree. So we're going to be thinking about what crackles are caused by in this patient. So the nurse recognizes that crackles throughout the lungs in this client are due to either infective infiltrate, collapsed alveoli, or fluid accumulation that's related to either pneumonia, heart failure, or reduced mobility. So we have to kind of zoom out and think about all of our cues here. And I've got some guesses starting to come in. Vanessa says fluid accumulation in pneumonia. Claudine says fluid accumulation in heart failure. So we have some agreement that we're worried about fluid, and I'm going to give that one to you guys because you're right. We've got an S3 present. We've got petting edema. We can see and hear that this patient has too much fluid. So that is likely our issue, fluid accumulation. But then from what? We need to think, is this from pneumonia, heart failure, or reduced mobility? And any of these things, I'll say, could cause crackles, but there's only one that's most likely in this client. And so let's look at some of these um, in order. <clears throat> so pneumonia. So if somebody has respiratory difficulty from pneumonia, what other symptoms might tell us that? Think like vital signs, lab values, assessment findings. Y'all seem kind of torn between pneumonia and heart failure, so I'm glad we're talking about it. So if somebody has pneumonia, which is an infection, it would cause crackles, right? Because I would have pus or infective infiltrate building up in the alveoli. <clears throat> but I would also have findings of infection, like uh, Temwa says temperature. Yes, I might have a fever. Maybe he's got chills. Abibaru says fever as well. Awesome. So right, if we had pneumonia, we would maybe see some signs of infection like muscle aches, weakness, anorexia, other things like that. But heart failure, I think you guys are onto something. And the majority of you are guessing that because yes, we've got all this heart failure risk factors present. It's worse when he's laying flat, right? That's called orthopnea, why he's having to sit upright. And if we look, we're gonna do a quick review of this. Whenever you've got heart failure from inadequate blood supply to the heart muscle, like in coronary artery disease, and maybe um, too much oxygen demand on the heart, like if you have hypertension and the heart's having to work really hard to pump against that high blood pressure. So those things are gonna strain the ventricles, cause them to weaken, and then we've got two problems. Instead of the blood moving forward to the organs, it goes backwards into the lungs and it builds up and then the alveoli can fill with fluid. And so that's actually what you're hearing when you're listening to crackles. And if you guys have never had a chance to actually listen to this on a patient, you can take a little bit of your hair and kind of roll it between your fingers here, right by your ear, and that's pretty close to what crackles sounds like. It's described to me as like a snap, crackle, pop, or Rice Krispies sounding noise. And I like to think of this like we're trying to blow bubbles through a straw, or we're trying to get oxygen in and carbon dioxide out, but it's going through fluid, like blowing bubbles through a straw. So that's kind of what you're hearing there. So good, fluid accumulation related to heart failure. You guys are right. But let's consider the others. So several of you thought maybe pneumonia, totally a good guess, really good guess, but we didn't have those signs of infection. He didn't have a fever. We had a completely normal temperature, so less likely. Also, he might have told us that he's coughing up um, like tan or green yellow sputum and we didn't have anything about that. Then our other option, reduced mobility, which would be most likely to cause collapsed alveoli. So that would be uh, crackles due to atelectasis where somebody who's had prolonged immobility, which he has, he's really not been getting up very much, 
then that uh, instead of taking deep breaths, you take these shallow breaths and the alveoli start to kind of collapse. And then you'd hear crackles when they take a deep breath and it opens them up. But those tend to clear with coughing and he's been coughing for two days and they haven't cleared. And we just have so many other signs pointing toward fluid overload which remember we got fluid that backs up because it's not moving forward to our organs, especially our kidneys, so we retain it. And we are correct. And again, only 51% of our users answered this right, so you guys who got it right are ahead of the curve. And remember, if you're ever confused about anything in these case studies, you can come down here and watch these video explanations and read our written explanations as well. So, all right, next we need to decide what this client is at highest risk for developing. And when we're thinking about prioritizing your hypotheses, you want to answer the question, where do I start? So what are they most likely experiencing, like we're being asked here? What are they at highest risk for? Or what do I need to do first? And I like to kind of think of it like this. If I can only do one thing for my patient and I have to walk away, what should that one thing be? So let's consider here, I'm at, this client is at highest risk for developing either respiratory failure, acute kidney injury, sepsis, or pulmonary embolism. And I'd like you guys to start to venture some guesses. Okay, while you guys are guessing, Stella made the great point that S3 is common with heart failure, but not with pneumonia, that's right. Very good. So, all right, what are we at risk for with heart failure? And we already have some early signs of one of these things, right? We already have decided that respiratory failure is something that we're worried about here. And that's because we've already got fluid in the lungs, we hear crackles, we've got hypoxemia and compensation for it. And it looks like lots of you guys are guessing correctly for respiratory failure, but for a second one, you've got kind of a toss up between pulmonary embolism and acute kidney injury. No one's guessing sepsis, so let's get that out of the way. We already decided we don't have signs of uh, pneumonia. And although any patient in the hospital is at risk for an infection, remember on the NCLEX, we're looking for actual issues over potential issues. So although he's at risk for infection, it's a bit of a stretch to say he's at risk for sepsis unless he already has a current infection and he doesn't. So you guys are right to omit that one. But let's look at these two. So pulmonary embolism. What conditions put you at risk for a pulmonary embolism? Because lots of you guys have guessed this one, which means that we did a good job coming up with a very NCLEX-like question because on the NCLEX, you always feel like you have more than one answer that's correct, right? So pulmonary embolism happens whenever you've got a deep vein thrombosis and it's gonna dislodge and travel up through the veins and obstruct the pulmonary artery. And F got it correct, he said DVT. All right, and so we don't have signs of DVT because what does DVT cause? We would see lower extremity swelling, right? But it would be unilateral. This is a very commonly tested thing. They want you to be confused and think that, oh, I've got lower extremity swelling. It must be <clears throat> a DVT, but that would be if it was one leg and he has a little bit of immobility, but much more likely if he had a recent surgery or the classic one is a long overnight flight and then they start to have calf cramping, right? So this would be more likely from a DVT respiratory failure from the heart failure because you've got fluid overloading the lungs. And remember, there's two problems with volume, with fluid movement in your cardiac output for heart failure. We can't get blood forward, so it backs up into the lungs, and what's not getting it is our organs. So we're at risk for end organ failure from that decreased cardiac output. And any organ can be damaged, but your kidneys are the most sensitive to a drop in blood flow because they get 25% of the cardiac output from your heart. So every milliliter of blood pumped forward from your heart, a quarter of that is destined for the kidneys. So we're worried that this fluid is not getting forward to the organs, but is instead backing up into the lungs. And that's putting at risk for respiratory failure and acute kidney injury. 
All right, so I hope that answers you guys' questions, that we're not really so concerned about PE because we have lower extremity swelling in both legs, not just one. So this is not looking like a DVT. Very good. And so, yep, we've got one out of two points averaged here. So it looks like everyone's probably getting that respiratory failure and confusing for one of the others. So remember to visit our explanation if you need more review for that. All right, so next, our next step is going to be generating solutions or deciding what can I do? And they'll ask either, are these interventions indicated or not indicated? Which actions would address that priority problem or maybe which actions would worsen the priority problem? And again, this really depends on your understanding of the content because we're gonna treat respiratory failure from pneumonia with antibiotics, where we would treat respiratory failure from a PE with anticoagulants. And so it's not always as simple as respiratory failure raise the head of the bed, right? Although that's true in most cases, we need to know what is warranted based on your understanding of the content and that specific disease process. So, all right, should we uh, anticipate giving blood for a culture or is that anticipated or not? And remember, we would want blood for a culture if we're worried about infection, right? Culture or sputum, uh, blood or sputum culture, those are going to help tell us about infection, but we don't have any signs of infection. Remember, we don't have um, like yellow green sputum, we don't have body aches, we don't have an elevated white blood cell count, we don't have a fever. So there's nothing here. And you guys are right. Evelyn, F, Temwa, you guys are all guessing not anticipated, and you're correct. How about an echocardiogram? I think these no's coming through were for the culture, but for echocardiogram, this is how the NCLEX likes to test your understanding of when certain studies would be indicated, is they give you a patient scenario like this and you need to know, do I need to prepare them for an echocardiogram or something else? And you guys are right that we don't need to culture anything. And y'all are saying yes for the echocardiogram and that's correct because the echo is gonna actually be an ultrasound of their heart. It's gonna visualize the heart, the valves, the walls, and it's gonna look for decreased cardiac output, valve issues, and anything that could be causing heart failure. So this is anticipated. Then your renal function tests. And you guys remember from the last question that we're worried about acute kidney injury. And renal function test is just a fancy way of saying that we're looking at the BUN and creatinine and all the electrolytes. So what changes would you guys see in your BUN and creatinine if we had kidney failure developing? And I think you guys know that one, but you're right, that we need to anticipate looking at the BUN and creatinine to figure out if we've got any kidney failure going on, because that's gonna affect what treatments are safe to give or not. Then administering supplemental oxygen. You guys know this, that if we've got a pulse oximetry under 90%, unless they've got COPD and then we have a different range, they need supplemental oxygen. So that's correct as well. And you guys are right. Maria, Temwa, Susan, you're guessing that the creatinine would elevate and you're correct. We would have a buildup, less creatinine is being cleared if our kidneys have failed. So that's correct. Then a 12 lead electrocardiogram. What's another big cause of heart failure? something really common that can cause heart failure acutely, something, something that would be a severe extreme form of it called cardiogenic shock, and that can happen sometimes if somebody has an MI, right? Now, he didn't tell us that he has any chest pain, but remember, he's got diabetes, and patients with diabetes don't always have chest pain when they have an MI. <clears throat> so we'd need to do a 12 lead just to make sure he's not having any ST changes. And then a serum B-type natriuretic peptide. What would you expect the BNP to be if he had heart failure? Would it be high or low? And I'm seeing that Takya guessed seven, Omatayu guessed seven as well, Fidelity, all you guys who dropped your guesses said yeah, guess yes for seven, and you are correct because the BNP is released by the ventricles whenever you've got stretch on the heart. So if you have too much fluid in your body from heart failure, um, from kidney failure, anything that would cause you to have a lot of fluid, and we do think we've got that with him. We've got crackles, we've got pitting edema, we've got an S3, so that will tell us if he's got heart failure. If he doesn't have an elevated BNP, he doesn't have heart failure. So, Average 5.6, good job, you guys. 
Then next, now that we've generated solutions, we want to take action or what will I do? And they might ask, should you do something or how do you do something? And here we've got new laboratory results and we're asked, which of these orders do we prioritize? So we're looking for something that's going to address the problem most directly and most quickly. So let's take a look at our new lab results where we have got a sodium that's a little bit low a potassium that's in the normal range, and then that BNP is elevated. So it is looking like we've got stretch on the heart from too much fluid. So what do we wanna prioritize? And I'm gonna watch for you guys to drop in some answers here. Preparing for a chest X-ray, giving enalapril, giving furosemide, or preparing them for an echo. And I've got guesses for four, for three. All right, so guess a couple different guesses here for different options. But I want to point something out. You guys might have heard this kind of test strategy that on the NCLEX, when you prioritize, you always pick to assess first. Have you guys heard that? And that is only true sometimes. Sometimes we already have all the information that we need to act. And so we've got two actions here, assessing, right, by getting a chest x-ray or assessing by getting an echo. But I don't really need, if I'm prioritizing ABCs like we should, I don't need to look at his chest x-ray or his echo to know that he's got too much fluid. And so several of you guys have mostly guessed, yep, Susan says action to remove fluids, right. And that is correct, but let's talk about this enalapril. What drug class is that? And I think you guys know this name, enalapril. So that is, Victoria says give furosemide. Enalapril is an ACE inhibitor, right? And that would lower the blood pressure. So although that is indicated and that would reduce the strain on his heart, the reason that we'd give furosemide first and you guys guessed it, that this is going to be removing the fluids. Now, furosemide, we might give that and his blood pressure would drop already, right? So if we give the furosemide, we pull off enough fluid, give him some relief, and his blood pressure drops, we might not even need to give the enalapril. So just a little tip for you there. We want to pick the action that's going to most directly and quickly fix the problem. And Vanessa has said that a chest x-ray and echocardiogram won't change the fact that they still have heart failure. And you are absolutely correct. Sometimes we don't need to assess first, and the results of that or that won't change whether or not he needs uh, Lasix now. If we did not yet have his potassium level, maybe I would need to draw the potassium level first, right? Because that would tell me whether or not it's safe to give the furosemide. But that wasn't the option here, so we already know that it's a safe level and we can give it. So well done, 65% got this right, so you guys are doing really well. All right, now we are at our final step. Uh, remember to invite your friends. If you guys are enjoying this, invite your friends to join our NCLEX Facebook group. Subscribe to our channel here. We love to have you. We love to come and see you guys every week and kind of uh, work through these NCLEX tough topics. So when we're prioritizing, uh, we're going to be looking at our prioritization pyramid where we eliminate stable and chronic issues and then prioritize our ABCs. And that's what we did in that prior question is we prioritized the action that was going to relieve his breathing problem by pulling the fluid off. All right. So evaluating our outcomes, we might need to answer, was our intervention effective, including teaching? Was our teaching effective? Or maybe what signs would indicate a complication or improvement? So you're following up and evaluating how what your intervention was affected the patient. So here, it's now two days later, We this patient's improved, they got their furosemide and enalapril, they're going home for discharge. And they're being discharged on those meds, the enalapril, metoprolol, and furosemide. We've given the discharge instructions, and which statement of theirs indicates that the teaching was effective? Select all that apply. And here's another tip for the NCLEX. When you're answering select all that apply questions, treat each option as if it's its own true or false. So I want you guys to answer true or false as we work through these together. So true or false, it's best if I take my furosemide first thing in the morning when I wake up. Yep, you guys want to pick that, and that's true, because 
Furosemide, we've already established, is a diuretic, and that is going to make you pee a lot. And a little trick here, furosemide, the trade name is Lasix, and the mnemonic is that it lasts six, or lasts six hours. And so if you take your diuretic at 9 p.m., your patient is not gonna get to sleep until like after two in the morning, and they're gonna be really unhappy with you. And they're not gonna get better because sleep is really important. So yes, we want to take diuretics in the morning, and that is on our diuretics cheat sheet that uh, Dr. Courtney kindly worked on, and so you guys can come check that out if you're members of the bootcamp website. Then next, I should avoid eating prepackaged foods and over seasoning my food with salt. And yes, you guys are all uh, selecting number two, and that is correct. A lot of patients, when they're told to limit their sodium intake, because sodium follows water and we don't want fluid retention, they think, oh, I'll just take the salt shaker off the table. But most of the sodium that we eat in our diet comes from packaged foods. So that is an important thing to make sure they know is to read the labels on packaged foods to look for something with too much sodium. Then how about three? Should they contact their healthcare provider if they gain more than three to five pounds in a week? True or false? And yeah, that is true. LaShawn, Fidelity, Takia, you guys are correct. We definitely want to notify the provider. We're, the reason that we're weighing regularly is because we're watching for fluid retention. If somebody has um, five pound weight gain in a week, that's not fat, that's fluid. And this person is at risk for a heart failure exacerbation. Now, to detect that, should we weigh weekly or how often? Is this true or false that they should weigh weekly to make sure they're not retaining too much fluid. And I really hope you guys remember that we should not be weighing weekly, we should be weighing daily. Every day with the same time, same scale, same clothes. So this is not correct. I didn't mean to check it, sorry. It, this is not correct. We would need to correct them and say, no, no, you need to weigh yourself every day. The week comes in when you've got three to five pounds weight gain in a week. Then next, certain over-the-counter medications like antacids can contain high amounts of sodium. And remember guys, medication interactions is big, big on the NCLEX, and a lot of antacids contain sodium, calcium, um, like calcium carbonate is Tums, and so that can be a hidden source of sodium. We never wanna ignore over-the-counter medications because they can be just as dangerous as some of the prescription ones. So this is correct as well. All right, you guys. So that is it, and uh, I hope you guys got something out of this today. Several of you say that you've learned a lot. Let me know. Um, you guys feel more prepared for the NCLEX after learning all of this, and I hope so. But you guys can check us out on bootcamp.com slash NCLEX. Follow us on all of our socials, and are there any questions that I can answer for you? I'm gonna answer, Omar is here. He says, just to clarify, we would still administer diuretics even if the sodium levels are abnormal or low. Will it not worsen the electrolyte imbalance? Omar, that's a really, really good question. And the answer, as with anything, uh, is it depends. But I'm gonna phone the audience here. You guys, why would somebody with heart failure have a low sodium level? All right, Silas. I'm glad you came too. Susan's a little bit better prepared. You guys are welcome. So somebody with heart failure would have a low sodium level because it's dilutional, right? They're retaining too much fluid, and so that dilutes the sodium in the blood. And so in this case, we need to pull fluid off. And remember, furosemide is a potassium wasting diuretic meaning that it spills potassium into the urine and potassium acts like a salt as well, just like sodium does. And so in this case, it would lower their potassium much more dramatically than it would their sodium. So we're gonna pull off potassium and water is gonna follow it and that's gonna raise the sodium level. So very good question. Although I believe thiazide diuretics, those work more on sodium excretion. So in that case, you would not give it. But I don't think that's actually something really important on the NCLEX related to thiazide diuretics. So you'll just have to go check out our uh, diuretics cheat sheet for the answer. All right. 
Chanel says, is this review good for PN as well? So if you're studying for the NCLEX PN instead of the NCLEX RN, do know that our product is specifically based on the NCLEX RN test plan, but we've heard from a ton of our users who are studying for the PN exam that they found this just as helpful. And in theory, if you're prepared to sit for the RN exam and exercise that level of clinical judgment, you should be able to do pretty well, and that's gonna translate to helping you on the PN as well. All right, Omar, you're welcome. Okay, so I don't see any more specific questions. If you have any questions left, you guys can drop them into the chat and myself or Dr. Courtney will try to get some answers to you. But thank you again for joining. We're so happy to have you here and tune in next week 